Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update, it's the 21st of July, and a number of nice updates this week. As always, we have the chapters, so you can jump to any particular update you care about, and quite a few new videos this week. So the main thing I've been working on for over a week is a study cram for the AI 102 exam. It's over two hours long, and artificial intelligence and machine learning, and GPT and all this generative AI is very popular right now. So I thought I'd create that to try and help people get that next associate engineer certification. But then also previous week, Azure AD was renamed to Microsoft Entry ID. I did a very quick video on the rename, but there were some very, very strong reactions. And I said I would create a video reacting to that. And so I created a video going over the move from the Azure AD PowerShell module to the Microsoft Graph replacement, because that was a big item of concern. But then I just did a reaction to the reactions on why I felt it was actually a good thing and why some of the really negative feedback I feel was maybe based on some misunderstandings. So I was just trying to clear those up. So those was those videos. On to what's new. So on the compute side, we now have Hot Patch available for Windows Server desktop experience. So previously we had Hot Patch for the Azure edition of the Windows Server uh, 2022 edition, but only Server Core, where it didn't have a graphical interface. And of course, Hot Patch is all about the idea that there were certain updates that previously would require us to reboot the operating system, certain kernel type changes. And what Hot Patch lets us do is patch those areas without having to restart the operating system. So now it is available for desktop experience as well on the latest uh, Server 2022 Azure Edition version of Windows Server. And obviously one of the things this means is there's less reboots, it's faster, smaller updates, and just overall better protection because I can get those updates rolled in that much faster. So that is now generally available. Azure Arc now has extended security updates in preview. So the whole point of Azure Arc, remember, is it extends the Azure control plane to things outside of Azure. So that brings with it some of the um, policy capabilities, the RBAC capabilities, the tagging, the inventory, much, much more. Also some of the Azure services. And I can think about Arc for the servers, Windows and Linux, Arc for Kubernetes, any CNCF compatible, and then services that build on top of Kubernetes, like database services, AI services, app services. But what this is talking about, so the extended um, security updates, the ESU, is if I have legacy products like Windows Server 2012, uh, SQL Server 2012, well now through Arc, that control plane, I can continue to get extended updates for those solutions managed all through the Azure control plane, through the Azure portal. I think it's up to three years that I can pay for this service, but it's now going to be seamlessly integrated with that. Now do remember, separately from this completely, if I have Windows Server 2012, you also do have the Azure Migrate solution. So what Azure Migrate will do is take those 2012 Windows Server instances create a version of it, a copy of it in Azure, and then do an in-place upgrade to Windows Server 2016. So there are different options available depending on what I am trying to achieve. And then now we have crash consistent VM restore points in preview when I have multiple disks. So if I want that multi-disk crash consistency, and that's now available in preview. Now remember, crash consistency is in powers just gets disconnected. It's not working with an agent inside the operating system that will be app consistent. This is just crash consistent. But it means all the disks, the snapshot of the disks in that particular restore point would be at the exact same moment in time as if the power was switched off and they all were at the exact same moment. That's really important if I have solutions using managed disks or any disk, I can't have them a few seconds out because I've got some transaction done on this one and not on this other disk. It causes huge problems. So this will now ensure they are all at the exact same point in time, right order. Um, the benefit of crash consistent as well is I don't need that agent. So 
I don't have to worry about some software running inside. I obviously can still use App Consistent. With App Consistent, it means there is an agent running inside. So for Windows, it would be using the Volume Shadow Copy Service, VSS, that tells the apps to flush stuff out to disk, pause any changes, takes the snapshot, and then resumes. Uh, for Linux, there's pre and post scripts to get that app consistency. So there is a completely different option to have app consistent. If I don't want the agent, hey, I can do a crash consistent option as well. Then Azure Kubernetes service now has event grid support for its update events. Now remember, the whole point of event grid is it's this engine that sits in the middle, and then I can have event generating sources Event Grid sees those and then hooks into event handlers. Typically, it's something serverless, a function, a logic app, a webhook. And what it avoids happening is those handlers have to hammer pole. Hey, do you have something for me? Do you have something for you, me? Do you have something for me? Instead, Event Grid sees the event and then calls the event handler. So what now we can have is a source for those events are the various AKS update events. So I could think about an AKS upgrade. It could be it complete, it canceled, it failed. Um, cluster going out of support, out of support notices could all now be a source for event grid, which could now call something that I could act on. And then Azure Functions now have Python 3.11 in preview. And AKS Network Observability is in preview. I'm sure I've covered this before, but basically it's a new add-on for AKS that gives me really complete observability into the network health and the overall connectivity. So I get cluster level network metrics like packet drops, connection stats. I get pod level metrics and network debugging features. It works for all of the Azure CNIs. So the Azure CNI, the Azure CNI powered by Cilium. It supports Linux and Windows node pools. It's very easy to deploy. And it does integrate both with Prometheus and Grafana. Now that could be the managed Prometheus, the managed Grafana in Azure, or it can just be bring your own that you've deployed somewhere. So that's gonna integrate with all of those. On the networking side, Azure Traffic Manager always serve as gone GA. Remember, Azure Traffic Manager is that global DNS resolution that would then return a record, maybe something closest to me if I'm doing performance. And what always serve says is, look, don't worry about the health probes. Always serve the traffic to a given endpoint. Just disable the health checks. Or I can choose a third party health check to determine the endpoint health and use that instead. For Azure API management, it now supports OData API type. Really, the Open Data Protocol is just this new standard that defines a set of best practices when I think of building and consuming REST APIs. It describes both the data and the data model. So I can now expose those using Azure API management. And on the storage side, if I've enabled the hierarchical namespace on an Azure storage account, so that means instead of going from this flat virtual directory where sure I can create directories in a container but really it's just part of the blob's name, when I turn on the hierarchical namespace, I get true directory structure, which means I can do true moves, true renames. Well, that's the Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2. If I have enabled that, what I can now do is if I have geo replication, so GRS or RAGRS, I now have customer managed failover. So that enables me to say, hey, I want to do a failover to the paired region. I can see at what state it's currently at and I can trigger the failover. Before we could do that if I didn't have the hierarchical namespace, now in preview, I can even when I do have that enabled. And then also for AKS, if I'm using ephemeral OS disk, remember ephemeral OS disk is if I'm using a VM SKU that either has sufficient temporary space or sufficient cache space, instead of having a managed disk for the operating system, I can use that temp or cache space. It means I don't have to pay for a managed disk for the operating system, but also the latency will be less, it will provision very, very fast. And with an AKS, there's nothing special about the OS disk. It's, it's stateless, essentially. So I don't care about having a real disk for that. Well, now I can still have a customer managed key for the encryption of that 
ephemeral disk running on the host. So I have complete control over that. It's Kubernetes uh, 1.24 and above. I have to set it when I create the cluster and the key will just live in my key vault. And then Azure Boost is in preview. Now we've actually seen bits of Azure Boost, we just didn't really know it. If you look at the E and the DV5, some of their performance improvements on the storage and networking are because of this. What we now we have in preview are some experimental SKUs that really take advantage. And what this is doing, it's taking work that the hypervisor or the host OS used to do, and is pushing it instead to purpose-built hardware and software. Now, that also means it reduces some of the attack surface because those processes don't run on the host server anymore. They're running on this very specialized purpose-built hardware but it's gonna give us crazy performance. They're talking about 200 gigabits per second of network and 10 gigabytes per second and 400,000 IOPS will be available with this technology. So you have to sign up for this, you'll get these experimental SKUs that will just see this uh, crazy, crazy levels of performance. And that was it. As always, I hope this was useful. Until the next video, don't panic and take care.